save his name to praise. Gotta get the world while live till day. In Pat Coward Church of Nacogdoches. You're always welcome here in Nacogdoches. In Pat Coward Church, where you still alone. Hey everybody, how many of y'all have lived through some junk this week? Amen. How many of you had some wind damage, hail damage? How many of you had some issues with your houses, with your properties, personal things, family things? I don't know about y'all, but I'm sick and tired of it. I was Amen. at the hospital last night um, with Carl, uh, and I want to share this with you. Carl Johnson was at the emergency room. I get the phone call to go up there, and his defibrillator had went off 18 times. Now, the description of what that is like, they say it's like a mule kicking you in the chest. Uh, we have a young man here who's going to be talking to you about a mule rodeo here in a little while, so I thought it was kind of pertinent, but he'd been there 18 times. They were going to flight him out last night from the hospital. Weather started kind of picking up a little bit, so the question whether or not they'd get him up there. And then Rayford was up there, and then Rayford wasn't looking good, and we was talking about him on the prayer list. And so I kept telling him, you need to get checked out. You need to get looked at. And so all of a sudden, I came in today, and there's things going on, and I want you to hear what I've got to say. Anytime, you know, we're, we're kicking off the Sad or Save Savages service this afternoon after church service, and I believe that God is going to move in a mighty way in that honky-tonk bar, and I believe that there's going to be some freedom won for some people. But in that process, we also see where the devil tries to rise up against anything that may come. How many of you know that anytime something good coming, you're going to have something bad coming to you? Amen? So in the midst of all the bad times, I always believe that the greatest thing to do is praise God. Yeah. And when you praise God, nothing can turn around and stop you. In Psalms 33, verses 1 through 5, it said, Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre. Make music for him on the ten-string harp. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything that he does. Can you kind of amen on that? Yeah. Verse 5 says, He loves whatever is just as good, and the unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. Amen. Now, guys, you don't have to be a theologian to understand what that means. Amen? Yeah. So when the problems come, lift your voice louder than your moans. Amen? amen? When problems start coming against you and the devil starts picking on you, guess what? You don't have to be the one to beat him up. Jesus already did. The Bible, if you go back into the Bible, it says at the end that he won. It didn't say that he might win. He won. Amen? So when we see that and understand what's going on, so if the devil starts moving on you today, starts moving on your family, your kids, your finances, your health, whatever else, you, you fill in the blank. Just look and say, you need to go talk to Jesus because he's already given me victory. Amen? Amen? So, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we thank you. We praise you this morning. Lord, I pray that, Fathers, today as we kick off a new service today, that, Father, we're going to see the gates of hell just rip wide open today. Lord, but your word says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name that, Father, as your people stand ready, that, the Lord, they're willing to charge the gates of hell with a water gun. Father, they will not stand up, and, Father, they will not back down. That, Father, when they do stand up, they'll run too, and, Lord, they'll take on the fight just as you did. So, Father, we thank you as Jesus carried that cross, and, Lord, as somebody helped him to that last point, Lord, let us help you here today, and, Father, please you, Father, and give you what you so desired. Father, to see another church here in Nacogdoches County, Father, another service us, another tribe, or Lord, whatever it is that you desire, let us always say yes and amen according to your dreams and your passions. So, Father, this is your service today. So, Lord, we ask that, Father, that you would receive our worship. Lord, I ask that you would open up the heavenly, the, the hope of the heavenly gates, and Lord, allow the choir to come join us this morning. Lord, we pray that, Father, every song that we sing and every word that we say, Father, would be according to your will. So, Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we glorify you this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship, guys. Sing great. 
serves me, the Father will honor him. And I serve the Savior, 
is what I was made for. His grace and love, well, I don't deserve, and I will be faithful, humble and serve a Savior. My life is greater because I serve a Savior. Thank you, Lord. Love you, I believe in the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel still makes the broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. I believe that the walls will start falling when we fall down on our knees. I believe that the lame will go walking and the blind are gonna see. I believe that the gates of hell tremble when the church begins to sing. I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. the daughters, sing it to the sons, to every generation, look at what the Lord has done, sing it to the darkness, that the light has come, sing it to the nations, look at what the Lord has done, sing it to the daughters. Singing to the sons Every generation Look at what the Lord has done Singing to the darkness That the light has come Singing to the nations Look at what the Lord has done Look at what the Lord has done as I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go and no matter where I've been, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. As I bow before you, 
the heart of God Come prodigal children It's never too late Run home to the Father Let Him clothe you with grace Bury your burdens, break free from your fear Step out of the shadows, there's no judgment here Cause there's only love in the heart of God No room for shame in His open arms Makes beauty from ashes so come as you are There's only love In the heart of God Oh, he's not sitting there Shaking his head Riding you off Leaving you lost not sitting there shaking his head, wishing he never went to that cross. He's not sitting there shaking his head, writing you off, leaving you lost. He's not sitting there shaking his head. He went to that cross. He went to that cross. Because he loved you so much. There's only love in the heart of God No room for shame in His open arms Makes beauty from ashes So come as you are There's only love in the heart of God No room for shame So come as you are There's only love In the heart of God There's only love In the heart of God Amen Thank you, Jesus It's broken Make it over Again But I Know a man Who can And I can't Take a heart That's sensey And make it white Whiter than snow But I Know a man who can Some call him Savior The Redeemer of all men I call him Jesus For he's my dearest friend If you feel no one can help you and your life is out of hand Well, I know a man who can I can walk upon the water Or calm the raging sea But I and one. 
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we thank you, and Lord, we agree with that. Lord, in our own power, Lord, we can't do any of that, but Lord, we know that you can. So, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that, Father, that you would move upon our society, upon our culture. Today, Lord, we see where it seems like this world is going to hell in the handbasket, and Lord, we need you here quickly. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that, Father, that your ways, your words be spoken here today, that, Father, we're able to go forth, and Lord, as the sign says on the door, Go ye into all the world and preach the good news. So, Lord, today, Lord, let the good news rise up out of this place. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, people's lives are changed here today simply by hearing your word. And, Lord, as we praise your holy name. So, Father, we praise you and we glorify you this morning. Lord, we ask, for the Lord, that you would move not only in this church, but, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that, Father, that you would move in every church here in Nacogdoches County and, Lord, all of our surrounding areas that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without uh, surrendering without backing away, without making it sissified. So, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that, Father, that your masculine word goes forth, that the enemy is beaten back, and, Father, your name be lifted high to the glory. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, Amen. Let's worship. Come on now. Give the Lord a hand clap. Oh. I guess I could holler. Whoo, all right. Have we got any first time visitors with us? Anybody that's never ever been to Impact Cowboy Church, if you raise your hand, we'd like to give you a visitor card. If you will fill it out and take it to the t shirt booth after church, you will get a free gift before you leave here today. And not a new car. <laughs> Jesse usually gets me on that one. Wednesday night services are at 7 p.m. Hope y'all can come on out and join us. Rayford Island's adult Sunday school class did not meet this morning because Rayford was out, but uh, and Mr. Carl was out. But they will be meeting from 9 to 9.45 in the youth building next Sunday morning. If all goes well, and we're praying for it all to go well. All right, let me see. Where Brenda? I guess you're making me do some of this. I'm right here. All right, you can do it. Yep. You want to do the soul mission too? I can do that. Do the soul mission. That map. You get all three of them. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, I won't be as good as Brenda, but hey, we're going to get it done. So tomorrow night, men's and women's meeting. Uh, coffee and cookies be served at 6 o'clock, 6 to 6.25, and meeting starts at 6.30. Men, we're over in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. We're going to be talking about the unity in the body of Christ and uh, living as children of light. I'd like to see each and every one of you men get here as and uh, get hooked up because the only way we defeat the, the enemy is through the word. So we need to learn the word. That's what we've been. That's what God put on my heart when I prayed about this men's ministry, and that's what we need to do. Uh, looks like we got uh, outreach. Did you do that one? Soul missions uh, Saturday, May the twentieth. Uh, it's a work day. They're having. Uh, they're re at the resource center, and they need about fifteen volunteers to help process and short and sort shoes for the outreach event is going to be on July the 29th. Uh, sign up list, Brenda says, on the back table. I promise you, you'll be blessed if you sign up and go. Uh, Saturday, July the 29th is, is when they're going to do this distribution there in Montgomery County, this whole mission shoe distribution. Then that day, they'll need about 20 to 25 volunteers uh, needed for that outreach. And uh, like I said, for both of those outreaches, if you need more information, get a hold of Miss Brenda, and she will be able to help you. Um, do I need to do the Village Knack one, too, or did you do that one? No, I didn't. All right. 
Uh, FYI, needs list for Village Night and Runner's Refuge are on the back table right back there. And uh, is Rafer still a contact? I know he's sick. Yeah. Miss, Miss Brenda, you can get up with her. I'm pretty sure Rafer can uh, still answer the phone, but we'll, uh, we'll do that. Uh, if you have any activities, announcements, please send those to Miss Marilyn by Wednesday at noon so she can get them in the bulletin for us on, by Sunday. Um, of course, don't forget to scan the QR code uh, for our ICCN calendar of events and mission news and prayer needs. They're all on the back table back there. Um, so now I get the honor of introducing somebody I got to meet this morning. He's sitting right there on the front row. He's going to come up and talk about this uh, mule rodeo we're about to have here shortly. Mr. Billy Jack Sprayberry, everybody. Give him a round of applause as he comes forward. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> well, I appreciate y'all uh, uh, inviting us out. Uh, I just want y'all to know real quick that y'all got a missing choir member sitting in the front row right here. I couldn't hear none of y'all singing over Hunter, so make sure y'all get him up here next Sunday. But I, I just want to thank y'all again. Uh, I'm, I'm part of Mule Rodeo Ministries, me and my little friend here walking in the back. Uh, he, he's come along with us. So uh, we're going to be here in a couple weeks, and we're going to put an all-mule rodeo on. If you've never seen it, it's like nothing you've ever seen, I promise you. So... Come and check it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's not a bucking mule deal. We have family fun, family games, and it's just, it's really close and dear to a lot of our hearts that is on the ministry team. So uh, come and check it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I wanted to share our verse with you, our, our uh, mule rodeo verse, and what it means to me and what it came about. But I feel like Mr. George and the preacher has already preached that verse already this morning, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a second. So when I was saved and went to come in to read my Bible after a mule rodeo, I was saved at a mule rodeo. I'm a mule guy myself. We, we, my wife and I, we have a bunch of mules and do things with them. And through a mule rodeo at our hometown, I was led to Christ through that rodeo. The next year, the Lord come to me and on my heart, and he said, I want you to do that for other mule people. You got to think about these cowboy churches with their arena teams. And not that it's a bad thing, but we kind of get pigeonholed into this horse culture, in the cowboy culture. Our barrel races, our ranch rodeos, our team ropings are all led towards the horse. You know, there's so many others, but as an outreach, if you'll open that arena to more things, and I'm not saying just mule stuff or whatever, just think out of the box. As an arena team leader myself, I know it's hard to think, what else can we do? But we want to keep going back. You want to keep it cowboy related, but there's so many other things that you can use that arena to glorify God with. And so as we started this Mule Rodeo ministry, and we went to praying and our mission statement and our mission verse and this and that, and as I was newly a Christian into my Bible, I wasn't reading it all the way. You know, you're just on fire, and boy, you go to missing words and this and that. If you'll get on your Bible, Matthew 18, 20 is actually our verse. And when I first got into it, and it's a pop, pretty popular verse. And I was reading it, and it said, For where two or three are gathered, I am there among them. That's what I read. Where two or three are among them, and that's what we were doing. We were gathering people in these arenas, and we were sharing the word with them. And man, we thought it was so cool. But we kept hitting stumbling blocks and this and that. And I went back, another a friend of mine in the ministry, Will, we went back and we're reading it and we're praying about it and we're talking it and we missed something. Did y'all catch what I missed in that verse? Whoo, Mr. George, 13 times prayed this morning in your name. Pastor King missed it four or five times. I was counting them, and it was just had my heart jumping for joy that this church is praying and preaching in Jesus' name and giving it back to Jesus, everything, just glorifying Him. And that's what we want to do with these mule rodeos. And it says correctly, for where two or three are gathered together as my followers in my name, I will be there among them. So we were doing these rodeos, and we would gather and pray. And we didn't see until we went to inviting him into those situations the blessings that come from it and the, the more things that he would allow it to come. 
not just these rodeos or just in the, in, in the arenas. I encourage you to do that in your everyday life, in work, in school, or whatever it is. And I can see that the, this church is already doing it. I, I'm sitting down there thinking, shoot, they're preaching it for me already. In Jesus' name, do everything and share it. So we're going to do something just a little bit different this, at this event. This will be our first one at Impact. And like I said, I really appreciate y'all coming. Uh, Biggin and I have heard that y'all have a pretty active youth group. And uh, we normally don't do this, so don't put it out in. It's a secret. This is a Nacogdoches special. <laughs> normally when I get phone calls producing and putting on this rodeo, people will call me and go, can I bring my horse to your old mule rodeo? I said, yes, you sure can. He ain't going to have no fun standing in the trailer all night, but you can bring him. I don't, I mean, it's an all-mule rodeo. But we would like to put, for our first one, it's usually a little uh, smaller on contestants. We have contestants that follow us all over the place. But if you have any youth, some kids that ride and they want to participate and get into it, we do want to open it up to some of the kids on horseback. We'll allow some of the horses to come in, so... Uh, if you have some youth that want to bring their horse and participate in some of the mule rodeos uh, or the events, we'd love to have you. So, thank you. Hello. So, on that note, as the youth pastor, <laughs> I was going to let you guys know that we are fully covered to youth camp due to all this fundraising. I know. <laughs> so... So every student who is signed up is going, they're not going to worry about finances, and through all the ministries and all of you guys, we're also covered via gas and any little extra spending the kids need to do on this trip. So thank you, super excited, and uh, that's it. <laughs> check, 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 one, two, check, one, two, one, two. Well, good morning, Impact Cowboy Church. Good, good to see all smiling faces today. Man, I'm glad y'all are excited this morning. Our offering from last week was $3,634. Give the Lord a hand for that. My God is good, and he provides. Because, uh, you know, as Pastor Stan was saying this morning, there's some challenges going on. There's some health problems going on. You know, a lot of people are out. Uh, my dad has got out of the hospital. He's doing good. Uh, he's recovering from uh, some stuff that he had, and I woke up this morning. How many of y'all ever woke up and stepped out in your carport and your, your truck's sitting a little funny? Yeah. Woke up, had a flat tire this morning, and so I was like, okay, God. There's, there's people going through a lot worse stuff than, than what I'm going through right now, but I'm just going to trust you, Lord. I've had multiple people say they're going to help me. Brother Randy, he's going to help me out and uh, take me to go get my tire aired up. God's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. And I was, you know, I don't, I have a hard time doing things sometimes. And it's like, okay, what am I going to do? All right, just calm down. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. Okay. Let's take a chill pill and chill the mill. For real. Before I shoot to kill, fire at will. For, anyways. Take your hands off of it. Take your hands off of it. Say, okay, God, <laughs> this is bigger than me right now. I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to trust you, God. Whatever your problem is, whether it's a health problem, we prayed for my dad. He's healed. He's getting the things that he needs done. There's Brother Rayford's in the hospital. You know, there's things going on. Don't let it get you down. It's easy. My, my first initial was, tire's flat. I want to pitch a hissy fit. It's like, okay. So, but I just, I looked at it. I was like, okay, what are we going to do? I'm going to pray. I'm going to give it to God. Look at your problem. Say, okay. I'm going to give it to you, God. I'm going to believe that you're going to show me what to do. I'm going to believe you're provide. And he will every single time. May not be how you want it. May not be how you're thinking in your mind. And that's the tough part, getting your mind out of it. Like, Lord, that's not how I wanted it to happen. But it happened. He got it done. So, with your finances, I always got to bring it back to your finances because I'm the guy that does the offering. 
and I say it every Sunday, give your money to God. Give your, give your tithe to God, whether it's 10% or more or whatever. Just say, God, I'm trusting you with my finances. Just like I'm trusting you with my health. Just like I'm trusting God with that tire. Just like I'm trusting God. Just like you're trusting, just like you're trusting, like you're trusting, like you're trusting. Give your tithes and your offerings to God and he'll take care of you. He's proven it. He's taking care of this church and he'll take care of you. So, $3,125 went towards the general fund. $19 went towards the kids fund. $400 went towards the arena fund. $20 went towards the building fund. $20 went towards the women's ministry fund. And $50 went towards the youth fund. Everybody's getting a little something, something. Everybody's getting taken care of. So, I'm going to pray and uh, get this thing taken care of. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Thank you, God, that you said you'll, you'll supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Not my riches, your riches. You said you will provide for us. God, sometimes it's not how we think it's supposed to happen, but if we trust you, we know it's going to happen. And when it's your way, it's the best way. So I thank you, God, for Impact Cowboy Church. I thank you, Lord, for all the ministries that we have going on that are being provided for because people are being faithful and they're believing that even when it's tight, they're going to give and they're going to be blessed because that's what you said. So I thank you, God, for it. I thank you, Lord, for Impact Cowboy Church. I thank you, God, for our guest speaker. I pray, Lord, that you would bless him mightily this morning. God, as uh, your word is being brought today. And we just give you thanks and praise for all that you do because you are number one. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. All right. Need all my kiddos back at the back for Kids Church. And I uh, love you guys. Y'all are awesome. Hey, hang on a second. Brother Randall, you want to come on up here with me for a second, please? Biggin, you want to come on up here with me for a second, please? What now? Don't know. I've been up here. Y'all come on up here with me. No. All right, so guys, here's the interesting thing is, I'm hiring a new security team here at church. So I always tell everybody, whenever you go to church here at Impact Cowboy Church, we feed our people potatoes, amen, and lots of beef. And so sometimes we see things, but I want to share something with you. Neither one of these two men go to church here, but the moment they walk into church here, all of a sudden they're part of home, amen? Because how many of you know that just because you go to this church, that church, uh, not even go to church, guess what? You can still be a part of the plan of God. And so when you start looking at Biggin, so I still don't know his real name. He just said, call me Biggin. I was like, yes, sir, because when I'm looking up somebody, I'm going to call him sir. So he looks at me and says, if you need me in any way, use me. Uh, just let me do whatever you want me to do, and I'll do that. And I sat there and I thought in my heart, I thought, how cool is that? As a pastor, you'd have somebody walk up in the church. You don't know him from Adam and says, here I am, use me. How many of you know there's a scripture where we see... Lord, here I am. Use me. And then you got somebody here on Randall. This is the second time Randall's been here. And Randall is somebody we're trying to be able to help get started, a tribe of a ministry. It's interesting because he says that they are a bar ministry with a motorcycle habit. Now, guys, I don't know about y'all, but when Billy Jack was talking about the mules and how they can get a little hold into one kind of thing, the thing that gets me is the church ought to be a multifaceted thing. It should be so multicultural type deal. How many of you know we need to have so many different types of groups in the church? And we're all going to look different, but I don't know if y'all have noticed, but he's the next professional wrestler. I think he's fixing to be the next professional wrestler. They're going to be a tag team, amen? 
Uh, guys, what we need to understand is when you come into church, you may not necessarily be of the same culture, but you can still look like each other, amen? You, as long as we look like Christ Jesus and we preach in his name, amen? Thank you, sir. That's all I want to do is pick on you for a minute unless you got something you want to share. Hang on a second. Hang on. Hang on. You'll have to give it just a second. It'll kick on. All right. We're live. Come on. I just got to thinking about something to the Mule Rodeo Ministry side of this deal. Y'all come. Bring somebody with you, please. Come on. Now, the next rodeo needs to be a Harley rodeo. Huh? Well, that'll be a hog huh? rodeo. Now, you don't, think, that. you don't think we can't plant some seeds. Come on. We can do it with mules just like we can do it with Harleys. Come on. So, Come on. look at here. These folks are getting excited over here on this side. Come on. Come on. Come on with it. Come on. Thank y'all. God bless. Thank you, Biggie. All right, young man, I appreciate you, sir. It really is being planned. Come on. Well, here's one thing we want to say. You know, Billy, um, Jack, when he was talking about the role or the mules and everything, we were talking about how our friend that got sent to the hospital uh, 18 times, 18 times his defibrillator went off. And it says it's like a mule kicking you in the chest. But how many of you know the Bible says it's not a matter how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get back up? Amen. So one of the things we want to talk about today is I want to talk about this young man right here and some of the things he's had to go through. If you've seen any of the movies on TV, believe it or not, how many of you have watched the movie Deadpool? I haven't seen it. I haven't been able to watch it, but I've seen bits and pieces. He was in Deadpool. He actually had a chance where Chuck Norris choked him out a couple of times. Uh, he's been in quite a few movies in Hollywood where he's done it. Plus, he's got his own Pure Flix TV network program or show. Uh, basically, he'll tell you about that here in just a minute. And so one of the things that we're looking at is when God calls you up out of Carthage, Texas, when God calls you up out of Nacogdoches, Texas, when God calls you up out of High Springs, Florida, when God calls you out of these places, your destination is unknown until you get there. Remember when, G, when God spoke to uh, people in the past, said, go. He didn't necessarily tell them where to go. He just said, go. They got to work it out. You see, you may plan your journeys, but God plants your footsteps. And so today, this is no accident that we've had two different ministries being here at this church this morning. Why? Because I believe the gates of hell are fixing to fling wide open. And I, but I believe that the gates of heaven are fixing to shut them wide, shut them closed. Amen. So, brother, why don't you kind of share with what you got going on this afternoon, and then if you'll pray for me so I can get started, I'd Absolutely. greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so like he said, we're we're starting this tribe of safe savages up here in Nacogdoches, and um, it's it's pretty awesome because um, you know uh, this ministry. When God told me to do this, I was like, you know, very. Out, I felt and still feel very unqualified, um, but with this ministry, it's the only thing I've ever really done that wasn't really hard. The only difficulty is to keep up with God and to stay out of his way, you know. Um, so that's, that's how it's been, and this new tribe starting here is exactly like that because uh, Joey had been reaching out for a while wanting to do something like this. And, uh, and so I, I called him and we started talking and, and then he's like, what does it take to start a tribe here? I was like, man, we've been talking about 40 minutes. I thought that's what we were doing. So, and, um, and we did on that conversation, talk about throwing a Harley rodeo, you know, in the fall, hopefully in the fairgrounds. So, so it's very interesting. Uh, it's, it's just an incredible thing to to be a, in the in the flow of God, you know, um, and uh, when I'm struggling, I'm struggling to get back into that flow of God because it's it's always, you know, I, when I go, God, where are you? You know, He says, I'm I'm the same place I've always been. You know, I'm this river that hadn't changed. Come on. You're the one that jumped out and wanted to take a shortcut across some peninsula or something. So when I'm dying of thirst, He just says, Come on back over and jump in the river. So. So, and that's what we do. That's what we do at Safe Savage, and, and uh, we're just trying to keep up with God. And it's incredible to be, you know, when I, when I sit here and when I was in your office and, and a couple of times now, 
which sounds because I've spent, you know, we got called into the office two out of two times I've been here. So, but, uh, you know, um, to have uh, a pastor and, and, a, and a church that is so supportive of, the, of other ministries, um, that's, that's incredible. To not be stingy with the pulpit. He even said that today. He said, if you have something to say, then that's God's pulpit, something like that. And I was, I was like, it, it's incredible. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and let you get to going. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here, to gather as a body, uh, to worship, and to, uh, to, to hear your word, Lord, and to just take in your word. Um, Father, let us hang on every, every, single, um, every single piece of that word, and let it just be nourishment to our souls, Lord. And Father, we just, uh, I just thank you for this brother and this pastor who's leading his flock in, in such an amazing direction and um, that's working with and, and so supportive of other ministries. And, and Lord, he understands that it's, it's about the kingdom. So Father, we just ask that you just anoint his lips to speak only your truth, Lord, that's right. that's this morning and, and to anoint us and open our hearts to hear and receive, and Father, to um, strengthen our souls and, and to just to to put it to action and to to uh, take heed to what is said today by you, Lord, and and help us put it right to right to the road and 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 keep walking it, Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Thank you man. All right, so guys, before I get started today, I'm going to give you a little heads up. If any of you still have kids in here right now, I need you to hear this. Today's message is going to be a rated A, which means a rated for adults. I'm going to be speaking about some adult issues and some things that are really real. Uh, this is not the story picture book thing of Noah uh, sitting on the ark with this little rounded little boat with a giraffe sticking out of it. This is real life that we're going to be talking about today. So if you've got a kid in here and you want to get them in children's ministry, now is the time to do it because I'm going to speak some cold, hard truth today. Amen? Y'all ready? All right, so guys, as we get ready, first of all, save savages in the house. Welcome. Love you. Appreciate you. Who was the wife that was praying for the husband? Who was the wife that was praying for the husband? There wasn't there one of the bikers, though, that was praying? It was you, Melanie? Melanie, I agree with you that when your husband goes in for surgery, you're going to be the one needing a prayer. So if you need anything, if you need any kind of meals or you need anything set up, you let us know. We'll be there to take care of you and make sure that you have what you need. Uh, we'll make sure that if he gets out of line, we'll just send some of our security guys over there and take care of him. Amen? So love you, girl. Appreciate you being here this morning. Uh, guys, I want to sit there and share something with you. Today's message is called Living in the Outer Fringes of Our Culture. Guys, looking at it through the world of today, um, Randy, where are you at? Or I guess Randy just took somebody. Randy was telling me in the news yesterday that there was a church today that was inviting a transgender person to come share from the pulpit today. And there was a big fight or a big thing going on out in front of the church over it, people fighting about what it is. I'm here to tell you the devil is alive and strong and well in today's society and culture. And here's the problem that is in churches, we need to make sure that we always stand up for God's word and never back down and never apologize, amen? So many times we're so quick that we don't want to offend somebody that we don't tell them the truth. And let me tell you something, if you can share with me a piece of truth that's going to save my life, I want to know what it is. I don't want to have to get bucked off, kicked off. I don't want to get stepped on simply because I was too stupid to listen to somebody saying, you better tighten that saddle up, amen? I need somebody that's going to speak truth and say, here's where we're at. This is what's going on. Guys, we got to start as a church speaking up and start speaking what's going on. And I promise you, there will never be a transgender person speak from this pulpit. That I can guarantee you. Unless they just got saved and received Jesus, amen? You're all uh, welcome to come to the church service that we're going to have over at Lugnuts. I never, ever, ever, ever thought I'd say come join us for a church service at Lugnuts. 
But do you know it's really freeing to be able to say that? Because what was meant for evil will get turned for what? Good. So how many of you know it's time that we start going into that neighborhood and start taking Jesus on the other side of the railroad tracks? We've been letting them come over on our side for years, and guess what? It's time that we go back. But if you are here at Impact Cowboy Church, you're welcome to attend, but listen to me, and I want you to hear me well. When you go over there, you're not going there as a spectator. You're not going over there to be able to sit back and get fat and lazy. You're going to go over there to serve because we are here to serve them and their culture. So that means you get over there and you open the doors, you greet people, and say, you welcome to church. You're welcome to the experience that's going to, where God's going to speak to you. If somebody needs some chairs moved, boy, that's what we're there to do. Our praise and worship team will be going, but we are here to serve, and we submit to their ministry this afternoon. So if Pastor Randall walks up and says, I need something done, what do you do? You do it, amen? Get it knocked out and help them and anybody that comes up. And guess what? There may be somebody that goes up to the altar and needs prayer. And guess what? If he turns around and looks at you and says, hey, will you get up and pray with them? Boy, you better look at his split get on up there. Why? Because that person may need some Jesus, amen? So as we start looking at what it means to live on the outer society, the longer we live and the more dedicated we are to Christ, I'm starting to look outward. It seems like I'm no longer in the middle. I'm having to get on the outskirts. I'm having to get on the fringes to see what's going on, the outer outreach. And guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I remember back in the Sunday laws, how many of y'all remember those? We've been talking about them lately. On Sunday where everything was shut down. I mean, there was nothing open except maybe a couple of convenience stores. And so you could go anywhere in town. The grocery stores were shut down. TGNY was shut down. If any of y'all remember those, y'all remember those? They were the precursor to Walmart. And I remember all these things in life and thinking, that's just normal. And all of a sudden now we talk to our children and they don't understand anything what we're talking about. Sunday is no longer the day where you sit at grandma's dinner table. Fried chicken, mashed taters, biscuits. Now's a day where as soon as church is over, they want to get out and run up and down the road and go do things. But one thing that I love about cowboys and I love about bikers, we have a way of not really fit in in a lot of places. How many of you have ever seen somebody that just didn't fit in? I mean, remember Garth Brooks. I showed up in boots and I ruined your black tie affair. Guys, let me tell you something. There's a lot of places that when you look at cowboys and you look at bikers, we don't fit in in a lot of cultural situations. We just don't understand all this fanciness. We just want a glass of tea in an old mason jar, amen? We don't need some fancy glass. We don't need all this. We just need substance, amen? So when you come into church, it ought to be that you're coming in to get substance, and what you learn, you got to go home and take, and you got to process it. Because it's not a matter of what pastor says, it's a matter of what God says. Last week, Russ Weaver talked about the wannabes. How many of you know what a wannabe is? Somebody that wants to be a cowboy, somebody that wants to be a biker. Now, guys, if you go to a biker church and you show up with a little Vespin scooter, <laughs> I have a feeling they're going to call you specially touched. They may call you Special K that day. I don't know. They're going to give you some kind of a quick nickname, and it probably won't be complimentary. But how many of you know in cowboy churches, when you see somebody come walking in, and they got their Kmart special hat on, and they got their fancy little doodads, and no matter how hard they try, you know they don't fit in. But you know one thing that Russ said last week when Russ Weaver was here, I want you to catch this. He said when they start coming in, at first they may not fit in. But if they keep trying, and they keep trying, and they keep learning, and they keep coming, eventually, they will change. They will become what they always wanted to be. How many of you want to be loved? Be accepted? All you got to do is keep trying, keep showing up, keep praying, keep reading. Eventually, let me tell you something, you'll start noticing changes in your life. And sometimes people will stop you and they'll say, you have no place in church. You don't belong here. Let me tell you something. And Jesus said the same thing. That's why Jesus didn't do a lot of preaching in the churches. He did preach in the synagogues, but when you see him doing his miracles, it was always on the streets. It was always in the places outside. Why? Because sometimes there's less believers in church than there is on the streets. Why? Because the people who are in the streets are desperate. How many of you have been desperate for God to move in your life? You needed God to do something in your life. 
You needed the child to come back home, to get off drugs. You needed somebody to set you free. So all of a sudden, you realized there's only one person, and that's Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but the day that I met Jesus, it was a day that changed my life personally. And I know that each and every one of you got a story. So I want you to, if you would, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, please. Okay, would you do me a favor, darling? Would you go to my office and get me a bottle of water? I feel like my tongue don't want to move. Thank you, babe. Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. This ought to be the scripture of every church in the world. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciples, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as his guest honor, and many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners and need to repent. Guys, point number one, those that are willing to give up everything to follow Jesus will get healed. I want you to catch something. Remember when he goes up to Levi and says, follow me? You know, he didn't say, well, let me shut up shop. Let me make the deposit. Let me go to the bank. Let me put everything away. It says he got up and he followed him. Now, guys, I don't know if you know who Levi is, but Levi is a person, and when his name got changed, became Matthew. How many of you know who Matthew is? Guys, one of the, Bible, one of the books in the Bible is written after him. Thank you, my darling. You are a beautiful young lady. I appreciate you. But Matthew became somebody, came a person after God's calling simply because he obeyed. How many of you ever heard God speak to you and you had to make a choice whether or not to obey? Some of us struggle with that daily. When he says, hey, come follow me. You know, he could have turned around and said, hey, let me, let me wait till the time clock rolls off at 5 o'clock. And once I make the last deposit, then I'll come get you. But you see, Jesus said, follow me now. Guys, I want you to understand something. So many times when God speaks to you, whether it's about a mule rodeo, whether it's about starting a biker church, whether it's about becoming somebody different, let me tell you something. Rex Crenshaw, when he first got started, he used to do a lot of horse showing back in his day. He's still in the horse world. He's still shoeing horses, taking care of things, one of the best horseshoers in the country. You won't find many people better. But you see, there's a point in time where he had to realize that he needed something more than horseshoeing. That can pay you bills, but it won't give you an eternal salvation. And so when you start realizing there's somebody greater, what did Randy Sayers sing earlier? I serve a Savior. And when you serve a Savior, all of a sudden, all of your problems are taken care of. You don't have to worry about where your next meal's coming from. How many of you realize that we need to worry less about what the world says and about what God has to say? You see, obedience will change your life. Do you understand that? When you start doing what you're supposed to do and when you obey, all of a sudden it gives room for God to move in your life. But you have to obey. How many of you know what the Ten Commandments are? Anybody know the Ten Commandments? That's not just a movie with Charlton Heston. Don't just come on TV once or twice a year. The Ten Commandments was something that was so much more. But do you know that in God's law there were 613 laws that had to be followed, that had to be dealt with? And all of a sudden, when you start looking at these laws, how many of you know that right now we got too many laws on the books? We don't even know what they are. Matter of fact, half the time you can commit a crime and don't even know you did. Well, I didn't know about that. What does the law say? Ignorance is no excuse. I mean, if you know if, that, if that's the truth, and that holds true in church as well. When we sin, ignorance is no excuse. How many of you know the Holy Spirit's up inside of you? And he speaks to you when you start doing something wrong. How many of you snapped off at somebody, got mad at somebody, did something wrong, and all of a sudden, that conscience is eating at you? So God said something that was really interesting. I want you to catch this. There are some things that I'm going to give to you, and I want you to write these scriptures down. In Numbers 15, Numbers 15, verses 37 through 41, 
when Randall was back there in my office today with Joey, and Joey said, I didn't know I was going to have to do any kind of math. I said, well, you know, the Bible does have a book of numbers. So you better know something about math. Lord gives us some instructions, and I've always told you, I don't know why in the New Testament they, they put the words of Jesus in red, but in the Old Testament, they don't put the words of God in anything except black. So in my Bible, I always highlight it purple because of royalty. When God speaks, this is his word, and this is what he said. In, verse, in Numbers 15, verses 37 through 41, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions for the people of Israel. Throughout the generations to come, you must make tassels for the hems of your clothing and attach them to a blue cord. Then you will see the tassels and you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord instead of following your own desires and defiling yourselves as you are prone to do. The tassels will help you remember that you must obey all of my commands and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that I might be your God and I am the Lord your God. You see, the tassels were a visual reminder of the consequences of not obeying. Now, when you start looking at the tassels, what he's talking about, they had a prayer shawl. Uh, and when you wore a prayer shawl, this is actually a shawl that I got when I was ordained. So the moment they ordain you, they put this on you. And it's a symbol of ordination. But in everything in the Bible has a representation and it's an importance. So what it said is you were supposed to take a four-cornered cloth that you wore around your neck and you tied these little fringes on the end of it. And they represented the law, so whenever a rabbi or a teacher had on their shawl with their prayer cloth and it had tassels, it was always a representation of the law. And it was supposed to draw you closer to God. How many of you ever heard the old saying, out of sight, out of mind? And so sometimes you see things, you don't really want to pay attention to it, you forget about it, and then two months later, oh, I forgot all about that. Well, you see, well, this is what the teachers, when they had these on, they had this thing. But now mine, we don't do the little fringes anymore on our prayer cloths or anything of that type of nature. And this is more of just an ordination thing is something symbolic. But how many of you know what fringes are? You see, in my, in my world, I like to ride horses. And in my house, we have over 900 acres that we live on. And a lot of it's rough wood. So when I go back here and I start riding, I have to wear my chinks or my chaps or something like that, and they have all these fringes on it. All right, so I really got to thinking about what's it like living on the outer fringes of life. It's on the outside. When I look at these fringes, it's supposed to remind me of something in the Christian world. When I start looking at this, I need to start remembering that I'm supposed to be following the law. And let me tell you something, the law is not such a bad thing. Here in Texas, the law is a good thing. And when it says, thy shall not cover thy neighbor's wife, It'll keep you from getting shot by 45. It's for health reasons. God gave us those laws to understand what was right and what was wrong. So when we put things like this on, it's designed to protect you, to cover you. I don't know about y'all, but how many of you know what these little lotus thorn trees are? Y'all ever tried to ride through some of those? Man, you got these thorns. Man, them things will kick off out like that sometimes. Boy, they'll just get you right in the leg, get you right in the hide or something like that. And boy, you're bleeding all over the place. And that's when you're starting to thankful that you got protection. Guys, the laws were given to us as a sign of protection. And so unfortunately, some of these people say, well, we don't have to follow the law anymore that we have Jesus. And yes, let me tell you something. Yes, you do have Jesus. But you need to understand there's an importance for the law. But sometimes you'll have to make a choice between a law and what's morally right. Guys, when it starts coming down to the point where they start saying pastors can't preach against something in churches, I'm becoming an outlaw. You ain't going to come tell me what I can preach from this pulpit. Matter of fact, I had um, a story, a relative one time got mad at me in our front yard and was telling me I need to quit preaching against drinking in Copenhagen. It didn't for her. So she came up to me. She was, we were having a big just roundabout, and it was a knockdown drag out. And it was ugly. But yeah, we were still doing it in a respectful kind of uh, way. And here's the thing is, God's pulpit is designed to be able to speak God's word and to speak truth to people. 
Listen to me, if you're doing everything in moderation, you're doing everything as you should, there probably shouldn't be a problem with some of the issues. But how many of you know that if you go in your yard and all you got is beer cans all in your yard, you might want to reevaluate your life. Amen? There's a better way to life. Out of all my years of counseling, I've never had anybody come in and say, thank God I started drinking, it saved my marriage. Thank God I started smoking dope. It saved my life. How do I deal with this today? I feel this mischievous side of me coming out. So let's turn over to Leviticus. This is where the adult part comes in. And I'm going to have to fly through this, so I hope that you're able to catch in with me. Ladies, I apologize for what I'm fixing to share. Not really, but... Trying to make it sound good. Leviticus 15, verses 19 through 30. Say amen when you get there. It says, when a woman has her menstrual period, she was to be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Anyone who touches her during that time will be unclean until Anything on which the woman lies or sits during the time of her period will be unclean. If any of you touch her bed, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. If you touch any object that she has sat on, you must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. This includes her bed or any other objects that she has sat on. You will be unclean until evening if you touch it. If a man has a sexual intercourse with her and her blood touches him, her menstrual impurity will be transmitted to him. He will remain unclean for seven days, and any bed on which he lies will be unclean. If a woman has a flow of blood for many days that is unrelated to her menstrual period, or if the blood continues beyond the normal period, she is ceremonially unclean. As during her menstrual period, the woman will be unclean as long as the discharge continues. Any bed that she lies on, any object that she sits on during that time will be unclean just as during her normal menstrual period. If any of you touch these things, you will be ceremonially unclean. You must wash your clothes and bathe yourself in water, and you will remain unclean until evening. When the woman's bleeding stops, she must count off seven days. Then she will be ceremonially ceremonially clean. On the eighth day, she must bring two turtle doves for two young pi- or two young pigeons and present them to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. The priest will offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Through this process, the priest will purify her before the Lord for the ceremonial impurity caused by her bleeding. Guys, point number three, the law was given that we would protect ourselves from any uncleanness. How many of you know that our society is putting uncleanness everywhere we go? You can't turn on the TV. You can't go to the movies. Matter of fact, I have to admit, uh, this weekend we had an awesome thing yesterday as well as Friday and Thursday. Uh, we had somebody bought out the opening, or I guess the movie night up here at AMC Theater, so we could go see Big George Foreman, the movie that was up there, and made it free for people to go see. And let me tell you something, that's a movie about God moving in somebody's life to change them from being an unbeliever to being a preacher and again a representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you know we need more things like that in society rather than less things? And we need to have something that honors God in everything that we do. And yet here's this law that's saying that when a woman has her time, has that period, she is ceremonially unclean. How many of you know that's a bad that's a bad time for most women, amen? I've had friends of mine say that they almost got divorced the first time they got married and she went into that time frame. It's like I married a sweetheart and I came home to a wolverine. I don't know what happened. But, he's, but it says that she's unclean, and it says that even if that period lasts longer than normal, how many of you know where I'm going at right now? The law during that period of time said that, that woman was supposed to stay at home. She wasn't supposed to leave her house. She wasn't supposed to leave her room. She wasn't allowed to go up and down the streets. Why? Because any place that she went, anybody that she touched, she would make them unclean. You understand what I'm saying? She was being held as a prisoner of the law. The law set her and said, you can't go into public. You can't go to Piggly Wiggly. You can't go to Walmart. You can't go to Kroger. You got to stay at home. But how many of you know that sometimes that things go on a little bit longer than normal? You can't allow the law to turn around and keep you 
held up. Because sometimes the laws were meant for something good, but it can get turned to a real bad when man gets involved. You see, the law recognized, listen to me, recognized that there was a problem, but the law was always designed to be able to give you a way back to God. You see, but somewhere along when man got involved, we took the compassion out of the law. You see, when a woman or a man sins, it would tell you, yes, there's a penalty, but yet go to the priest and make a sacrifice and you will be made clean. You see, there was grace involved in the law. It wasn't about punishment. It wasn't about slapping somebody when they were down. It wasn't about hurting them. It was about trying to protect people. It was about trying to help people live healthier lives. You see, sometimes we find that we need some purification in our life and we need to change. Guys, if you would, turn into Luke chapter 8, verses 40, please. Luke 8, verses 40. Most of you can already tell this is the story about the woman with the issue of blood. Most of y'all know this story very well. Luke 8, starting at verse 40, going through 48, says, On the other side of the lake, crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was 12 years old, was dying. And as Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowd. Verse 43, a woman in the crowd had suffered for how many years? How many of you have ever struggled with a sin or a problem for 12 years? And you kept wondering, is it ever going to get to be the end of this? Am I ever going to find a healing? Am I ever going to find a relief? Am I ever going to get clean from this? But it says that for 12 years, with contact, uh, with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robes. Immediately, the blessing stopped. Verse, or the bleeding stopped. Verses 45, who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees before him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Verse 48 says, Daughter, he said to her, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. See, Jesus came so that others would not be locked up in the law. And so I think about this woman. Here she was supposed to be holed up at home. She was supposed to be in prison at her house. And she just said, I'm going to follow Jesus. She said, all these people heard about Jesus. They knew he was there. Everybody was excited. And everybody got really, said, I'm going to leave the house. We're going to go see this man. We're going to find out who he is. And this woman wants to come up behind him with all the crowd. Now, I want you to catch this. It said, there was a crowd of people. But yet, what happens? This woman turns around and comes walking up to him. He goes through the crowd, touching everybody in the crowd, bumping up into him. Come here, son. Uh, bumping into him and trying to get past him. And then all of a sudden, they're saying, Jesus, right there. All right, Biggin, I want you to get right there, please. Just turn back around that way. All right, so I want you to hold still, okay? So I want you to put this on. God, you are a biggin'. So all of a sudden, here's this woman and all these people around, but there's Jesus. She wants to touch the tassels of his, on the hems of his garment, which is his prayer cloth. But it says, come by, and what does she do? She's like trying to push through and she's trying to get, and she just knows that she just reaches up and just touches, just the hem. She don't even have to touch him, just touch the hem of his garment. Listen to me, those tassels represented the 613 laws that she was trying so hard to be able to be set free. She was trying to grab a hold of those laws because she knew that if she grabbed a hold of all of those laws, then guess what? There may be some righteousness there. There may be some relief there. There may be some healing. And so all of a sudden, what happened? She grabs it. You can go ahead and let it go big. I'm going to have to get you a bigger pair. You're a triple X wide, right? <laughs> <laughs> These are mine. <laughs> he just called me a boy. <laughs> Dang. 
But you see, I want you to catch this. The law was not supposed to keep us in prison. It was supposed to give us a guidance and direction to draw us closer to God. As that woman reached up and said, if I can just touch the hem, I can just touch. It's the visible reminder of God's grace. And why do we use the law to beat people down? Because let me tell you something, the law was never designed to keep people down. It was designed to help people get up. But you see, that woman, she was deliberate in her faith. She left house knowing that there was a, a debt. She knew that when she left there, that she was unclean. She was willing to bring a pandemic to the community so that she could get healed, so that she could get set free. Because every person that she touched, guess what? They became unclean. But you see, because of her faith, when Jesus said, because of your faith, guess what? You're healed. Guess what? Every person that she touched was healed. They were set free. I want you to catch what Jesus said. This is in his words. It's written in red in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17. This is Jesus out of the New Living Translation. I hope you catch this. It says, don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophet. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Son, if that don't make you want to get Pentecostal and run, nothing will. You see, this woman, she understood that when she went to go see Jesus, she was looking for something more than just the law. She was looking for grace. And guys, listen to me. We preach the law. We preach grace in church. But you see, we always say God is love. How many of you know God is love? All right, we know that, right? That's no problem. But listen to me. God is also just. Oh, come on. We never want to talk about that in church. But when you break a law, guess what? You got to pay a price. All right, it's like Brother Michael, whenever I got that horse from him, he showed up at church completely drunk, falling down on himself. His wife was something else too. Got saved in the middle of service, laughing and crying. Come to Jesus. I didn't know if he was drunk or if the Holy Ghost had done got a hold of him. He stayed up there and he started working his life out. Then he goes to prison because of things he had done before. So I go up there and visit him in jail, and he said, Pastor, and he was just a newborn Christian. He said, Pastor, I don't know why I'm here. I gave my life to Jesus. And I had to look at him, and it choked me up. And I said, Son, listen to me. Your heart may belong to Jesus, but your butt belongs to Nacogdoches County. And this is where you're going to be. You're going to have to pay for your sins. You'll have to pay for this price. It's just part of what we do. But you see, this woman... All of a sudden, she goes to the greatest law. She didn't go to the sheriff. She didn't go to the doctor. She didn't have any more money. Other versions say she spent all of her fortune trying to find remedies, to try to find cures. She didn't have another dollar left. She didn't have another day to waste. She was desperate looking for Jesus. And she walks up behind him, and she grabs him and comes to find out that he was the fulfillment. He was the person who ensured that all the laws came to be. How many of you remember what it was like mom and daddy telling you not to do something? How many of you had a grandparent that turned around and told you not to do something? I don't know about y'all, but my daddy only told me once. And half the time, he didn't even do that. How many of you remember the look? The look was horrifying. Because the look made me realize that although my body was still here, my soul just departed. I was going to die. So I knew that when my daddy looked at me, and if he even used the, word, the letter D, I knew that I was in trouble because he didn't have to say the word don't do that. I knew what was right or wrong. How many of you know when we're five or six years old, we know what's right or wrong? We just may not want to do it. But you see, the constant law will teach you what's right or wrong. Verses 49 through 56, remember the guy that we talked about, Jesus was on the way to the house? I want you to catch this. It said, while he was still speaking to her, a message arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But then Jesus heard what had happened, and he said to Jairus, 
Now, I want you to be, catch this and underline this. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. She will be healed. Here's this guy said, hey, don't bother the teacher. Your daughter died. But here's Jesus said, don't be afraid. Just have faith. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I have a hard time as a pastor when people come up to the altar for prayer time. And I don't want to use the word just have faith because I find that sometimes the word just is a hard word to swallow. When somebody says, well, you don't have enough faith, if you just had a little bit more faith, what they're saying in the word just, you just need to try a little longer. You need to try a little harder. But let me tell you something. Jesus already done gave us all. So when Jesus turns around and tells you all you got to do is have faith, you can listen to him. Don't worry about listening to your neighbor. Always listen to Jesus. When you start listening to him, guess what? You're going to find your healing. It says in verses 51, when they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew that she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. Guys, when you see or when you need a miracle, you need to surround yourself with people that will believe and have faith. You see, when he gets there, the first thing he's done doing, he's already telling Jairus the whole way, don't worry about it, just have faith. And when they get there, he's saying, she's not, a, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And then everybody laughed at Jesus. How many of you know it is not good to laugh at Jesus? You fixing to get made a fool of, amen? Daddy's going to take you to the woodshed. So what happens? He gets up there and he says, we're going to go up in the house. And what does he do? He only goes in with his close companions, and he goes in with the mother, and he goes in with the father. And let me tell you something. When you see a mother and a father that believe in their child, there'll be nobody else that'll fight for that child like a mother and father. So they go up into that room, and all of a sudden, Jesus looks at her and says in a loud voice, get up, wake up. Get over this thing. Shake it off. I don't know about y'all, but when my daddy did, said shake it off, I don't care if my leg was falling off. I was shaking it off. It'd make the dead man rise. But all of a sudden, the girl wakes up, and she gets up. Now, this is the part that's really cool for me. Jesus said, she's hungry. Give that girl a biscuit. Give that girl something to eat. And then all of a sudden, now, now I want you to catch this. What did he say? Go for it. Don't go tell nobody. What are you going to do? Hold that girl up inside the house? That little girl's going to want to go outside and play, and all these people are going to see a dead child walking. They're going to be yelling, zombie nation. They're going to be sitting there saying, hey, that child, how did that child get up out of here? Let me tell you something. Jesus spoke over her. Guys, listen to me. In our families today, we just need Jesus to speak over our families. There's some dead things that you've got in your life, and you just got to have faith, and you've got to allow Jesus to speak into it. Because let me tell you something, there's sometimes those people around you, they ain't always your friends. They ain't always speaking life into you. But you find those people that have got faith, and what do you mean by faith? People are saying, don't believe the report of the world, you report and believe the word of God. And when the doctor's word, when you go into that hospital, and they're saying, I don't see a way, let me tell you something, I praise God the doctor's word is not the last word God's is. Don't you dare come back and turn around and tell me a negative report. I'm going to believe what God says. I've seen so many times where somebody had been on their deathbed and all of a sudden God show up in the room and see them get healed. And man, let me tell you something. It's funny because when Judy got healed up out of her deathbed, boy, how, how many years ago was that we said the other day? Twelve years ago. Went up and seen her in the hospital, you know, prayed over, said, you're not going to die, you're going to live. A couple of weeks later, I guess it was, or just a few weeks later, she comes walking down the aisleway of that, that hallway, looks at me as she walks by, and the first time she's been in the church, and she looks up and she says, Pastor, I got a testimony to give today. And you know what? I didn't have the nerve to stop her. Because if Jesus wants to show up in the emergency room or in the ICU and save somebody and give them life, guess what? We need to have them people up here come and give their testimony. And we need to hear that Jesus is still doing what he said he would do. How many of you know he didn't quit his job? Come on, Jesus ain't on unemployment.
But you know, sometimes the church don't even believe it. Sometimes the religious figures don't even believe. I want you to look in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. It says, one day an expert in the religious law stood up and tested Jesus by asking him this question. Teachers, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Have any of you ever asked that question? Lord, what, do I, what must I do to go to heaven? Can I just make a deal with you? Can I pay a little penance? Can I give you a little uh, tithe or can I give you a little tip? Can I get into heaven? But it says Jesus looks at him and asks that, or they ask Jesus that question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? And how do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Then the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? You see, he missed the whole point of the law. Remember, the law was supposed to bring you to a place of compassion, a place to bring somebody back into the, the presence of God. And when we see that this guy is saying he's so caught up on the law that he's trying to speak through man's eyes and not God's eyes. How many of you know that we know who our neighbor is? Oh, come on. How many of you know that that person down the street, that Widow Johnson, her yard ain't mowed, that's your neighbor? How many of you know that you see somebody like Brother Joe, his truck's broke down on the side of the road and he's got a flat tire? That's your brother. That's your neighbor. Go help him. And guys, there may be somebody on the side of the road that you don't even know. Guess what? That's your neighbor. You see somebody on the side of the road. Matter of fact, I remember one time I was going down the road and a handicapped van was parked on the side of the road, had a flat tire. Guy was in the back of it in a wheelchair. And there's this woman, a Hispanic couple, and she's trying to change the tire to this van. And she wasn't able to change that tire. And I've got my youngest son, which at that time he was really young. And he was up in the truck and he's sitting there watching. I think my wife was in the truck. We stopped and I put the locks on and said, I'm going to go out there and help change this tire. Go out there and help change this tire. And I don't speak any kind of Spanish other than enchilada, burrito, fajita, other, you know, that kind of stuff. Nachos. I didn't have to speak any kind of language. The, the, the love of Jesus was enough. So I was able to change that woman's tires. They got him, got him loaded back up in the van again and drove away. And listen to me. They tried to give money. Of course, we, you don't want to take that. But let me tell you what the reward was me for that day was when my son looked up and said, Dad, why did you do that? Why? Because it ain't about money. It ain't about recognition, but it's about serving the community of God. And they were of a different culture with a different language. I couldn't understand them. I kept praying they'd offer me some tamales, but that never happened. <laughs> but let me tell you something. To see my son think about that. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks later, you see when you're in the parking lot of Walmart and you see your child running across to go help an older lady with a shopping cart. Yes. That's when you get it. That's when you start acting in compassion. That's when Jesus said, whatever you do, you do in my name. Whose name? In Jesus' name. Not in your name, not in your culture, not in your club, but in Jesus' name. The reason why we don't see if an advancement going forth is because we're not doing enough in Jesus' name. We need to go into honky-tonks and bars. We need to be taking back some ground. The Bible says every single place that you set your foot, you claim for God. Let me ask you a question. Where are you stepping? Where are you stepping? Have you claimed the area that you went to for God? Guys, there's some of you here today that came in here and said, Pastor, I don't know what I just walked up into. This is a different kind of church. Well, there's a reason why you're here this morning. You may be stuck on some kind of a law. You may be looking at something and you're thinking that your life is stuck and you got no way out. But let me tell you something. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to do away with it. He came to bring compassion to the law, to take it away from man and show you what it was like from God's kingdom. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want this question, and I want it to echo through your head for a moment. Is there anybody to say, Pastor, man, I've been suffering for something for way over 12 years. I've been suffering for something called sin my whole life. 
And today is the day that I want to have that compassion. I want to reach up and touch the hem of his garment. I want so badly to be able to change my life today forevermore. And I need Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to ask for forgiveness, you want to ask him to fill your heart, to take over your heart, to change you, I want you to raise your hand right now. I do not want you to leave this place. Guys, listen to me. Do not leave this place thinking that the law will save you. The law was only a representation, something to remind us. I see that hand. I see that hand, sir. I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand, ma'am. I want to ask you a question. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you want to be able to see God move in your life, you want a deposit of the Holy Spirit up inside of you, knowing that you are saved without a doubt, that you don't have to worry. For all those people that just raised their hand, would you please stand right where you're at right now, please? Stand to your feet, because we're going to pray for you. Y'all go ahead and stand up. I promise you this will be the best thing that you ever do in your life. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I thank you through the obedience. Father, for these people standing up, that, Lord, they're able to receive not the law, but the grace thereof. Lord, the name of Jesus Christ. Father, the name that saves all, the Father that asks. Lord, we could call him Dr. Jesus because, Lord, he's healing us today. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, as we recognize that we're a sinner in need of a Savior, and, Lord, we need forgiving. That, Father, we stand up and, Lord, we shout out, Jesus is my Savior. I am so sorry. I ask that you forgive me. Lord, I just speak over these people here today that, Lord, there may be people here that are walking through some hard times. Lord, they need a touch of grace. And, Lord, they need a touch of Jesus' hem of his garments. Lord, they need to see that forgiveness and that blessing be upon them. Lord, I ask that, Father, that you would bless them, touch them, Give them the opportunity to see who you are. That, Lord, that you are powerful. Lord, you are Lord of all. That, Father, there's nothing that can beat you down or make you retreat or surrender. That, Lord, that you're always going forward to find those who call out for the name of Jesus. So, Lord, I just thank you today. That, Father, that you bless each and every one of these people here today. Lord, they are a blessing. They are the head, not the tail. They are the top and not the bottom. Lord, they're blessed in their coming. They're blessed in their going. Lord, they're blessed. Father, in their homes, their families, their health, their finances, their herds, their crops. Lord, they're blessed in everything. And that, Lord, the words that come from their mouth not be for their own, but, Lord, always be for your kingdom. That, Lord, the words will always be filled with power and, Lord, will never fall to the ground. Lord, do they have strength. Your word will not come back void. So, Lord, I speak blessings upon each person here today. That, Lord, as they get ready to leave. And, Father, as we get ready to go to lug nuts, Lord, I know I have a hard time getting used to saying that. But Lord, how much do you rejoice in saying that? That Lord, I pray that Father, there'll be people today there that Father will cast off any restraints the devil has given them. And Lord, all the plans that Satan has upon them are canceled out and cast off. That Lord, there'll be people set free today. Say, Jesus is my Savior. So Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we glorify you. In Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said. Guys, I want you to, before you leave here today, if you raised your hand, if you stood up, do me a favor. Please come up here and see me before you leave because I want to make sure that we're able to talk to you and make, uh, make sure that you are fully aware of what's been given to you today. Guys, we love you. Yes, ma'am? What you need? Hang on just a second. take a second for it to cut on. Okay. So, God's told me I got to come up and share this. Um, Most of you know y'all been praying for me for the last couple of weeks. Just a few people know what's been going on. On April 1st, I ended up with my face swelling, severe muscle cramps, muscle weakness, tremors, and vision issues. 
Doctors still have not been able to figure out what it is. They've run tests from A to Z, even a brain scan. They have found nothing. Everything's come back normal. Well, at that point, I don't know how she waited 12 years because a month was long enough. At that point, I asked God, I said, look, they can't figure it out. You're going to have to fix this. I can't do this. Three or four days ago, I noticed I had my strength back. I haven't been able to get on my horse. I haven't even been able to walk a normal pace. But I was able to walk out in my pasture and not have any trouble. Face is still swollen, still have the muscle cramps, but I have my strength back. I have not had any muscle tremors in three or four days. Come on. So I give it all to him because doctors ain't done nothing <laughs> other than say, we don't know, you got us stumped. So God heals. He's still in that business. Amen. You just have to trust him. Amen. Well, that was today's sermon. She got on her horse and she rode. Matter of fact, she had it on video on the internet. Guys, I want to release you here today and I want you to know something. Jesus is still alive. Don't ever let anybody ever tell you that those things ain't available to you anymore. There's no place in the scripture that says it disappeared. Matter of fact, the book of Acts doesn't end. If you go to the last chapter of the book of Acts, it doesn't say the end is still being lived out today. And you're a part of that chapter. Wherever you go, speak the name of Jesus over every situation, over every problem, over your family, over yourselves, your finances, your health. Guess what? If you're in the body of Christ, guess what? There's no safer place to be. Amen. Y'all be blessed in Jesus' name. Love you. Remember, if y'all came to, if you gave your life to Christ, come up here and see me this morning before you leave, please. <laughs>